Um, so our next talk is called Hacking ISPs with Point to Pawn Protocol over Ethernet, PPPOE. Uh, we have Gal. Um, it's the second time at DEF CON. I guess we didn't scare him the first time. Uh, but please give him a big cheer and uh, let's start. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So, hi, everybody, and welcome to my talk on hacking ISP with uh, PPP or E, or as the title says, point to point protocol over Ethernet. And um, first, I'd like uh, to thank DEF CON for having me here again this year, and this time in person, so I'm excited. And uh, before I begin, let me share a quick story with you. Um, so on this research, I've been working on and off for the last two years. And uh, as of course, it was during the pandemic, and like everybody else, I had to work from home. However, uh, this research involved this device on my kitchen table for almost a year. And uh, let me give you just a quick example how it sounds like. I'm also gonna pray the, the, audio, the audio gods that it's gonna work. Wait. No audio. Oh, damn. Wait, so I got a fallback for that. And I'm going to, just gonna play it from my, uh, from my uh, uh, phone. So this is how the device sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, so um, before I begin, I would especially like to thank my wife, Ortal, that sits here with us today, uh, that sh for sharing a single bedroom apartment with me and that device. Uh, yeah. Thank you, honey. Yeah, yeah. Tough year, the pandemic. All right, okay, so uh, enough about that. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's begin. My name is Gal, and I've been causing rockers on embedded device for quite some time. And um, as I said, this is a two years long research, uh, and I actually started working at it uh, when I used to work at Aleph uh, Research, and I ended it in uh, CyberArk Labs, where I work today as a research manager. And today we're gonna talk about three subjects. First, I'll introduce the idea and motivation behind hacking internet service providers, ISPs. After that, we'll do a crash course in layer two communication protocols, and I present some cool vulnerabilities I found. And lastly, I'll share how I was able to research this kind of equipment, and hopefully I'll, I might convince you that at the end of the day, um, a big ISP network equipment, it's not that different from small home router research. Okay, so let's begin with pwning internet service providers. So we all know how a classic remote attack is executed. Uh, usually attacker looks for a victim on the internet, maps the attack uh, surface by discovering what protocol the target uses, and then try to use O-Day or N-Day and hopefully get RC on the target. Ironically, many of these classic attacks are nowadays taking place on home routers. So the idea is that ISP network equipment, it's not that different. Instead of the internet, we got our ISP network accessible from our local modem. And instead of the internet server, we got the ISP equipment that provides us services. So all we have to do is to map the attack surface, find an O-Day, and hopefully get an RC on the ISP network equipment. But why attacking ISP? Well, if I was the proud pawner of Evilcom LTD, I might be able do, to do some of the following stuff. For start, the obvious denial of service and other ransom activities like shutting down the network and asking for money to stop doing it. Uh, but I can also execute DNS hijack for the entire network, aka become man in the middle for all subscribers by redirect their DNS to my own evil DNS server. And another interesting idea is to target a specific subscriber by their actual identity, aka the actual name and other information the ISP stores on them. 
I also might be able to, uh, might be connected to the internet backbone uh, for IP allocation, so I might be able to execute this crazy scale distributed uh, denial of service. And lastly, I can execute all sorts of attacks by abusing common protocol and technologies used by the ISP. Okay, so to understand what we are about to attack, let's understand how basic ISP network operates. Keep in mind that this is a simplified example for DSL-based network, but other tunneling protocols such as PPPoE, L2TP, GPON, they all follow more or less the same concept. So when you get your router from your ISP, uh, it has two roles. One is to provide network services such as Ethernet and Wi-Fi to your home premise, and the other role is DSL modem functionality. The DSL modem basically uses the good old telephone line to connect you to your ISP and then to the internet. Your modem is hooked up to a phone line and the telephone company connect the other end of the line to something called DSLAM. DSLAM is basically a multiplexer that extracts dig digital information from analog signals by uh, sends from multiple modems over the telephone lines. Okay, the DSLAM is then connected to a broadband remote access server, or BRUS, which is basically a big router that routes traffic to and from the DSLAM to the ISP network. So we can abstractly think that our modem is connected with a layer two cable directly into the BRUS itself. And we, so we can also bridge the modem traffic to our own evil machine. So now we can think abstractly that our malicious machine is connected with a very long ethernet cable directly to the brass. So if the brass is the ISP's frontline router and we are connected to it with a network connectivity, then hacking this brass is the equivalent of hacking the ISP's home router. All right, and this is where home router takes the power back. Uh, they can attack the brass in the same way hackers can attack them from the internet. Once we control the brass, attackers can execute uh, some of the attacks I mentioned before or uh, attack other ISP network equipment. All right, so for this research, I decided to target Redback Network Smart Edge equipment. Back in the 2000s, Redback were a big uh, player in ISP equipment. They were actually involved in defining some of the protocols I'll show you today. Uh, in 2007, they were acquired by Ericsson that continues to manufacture new products under the Redback brand. Some of these devices are pretty big and can support up to half a million subscribers. For example, the one that you see at the bottom right. And uh, they all use custom NetBSD operation system called SEOS, Smart Edge OS. And they also use uh, a PowerPC architecture. Okay, so now that we have a target and we see it's worth hacking to it, let's understand what kind of protocol can be used to attack ISPs. All right, so let's start with point-to-point -point protocol over Ethernet or PPPoE, which is a layer two encapsulation protocol. This, this is a common protocol to connect to ISPs. And in our case, the PPPoE server is the uh, ISP's brass. And the PPP client is our DSL modem or malicious machine. And remember that we just saw that abstractly the client is connected with an Ethernet cable to the brass. So as the name of the protocol suggests, by using PPPoE, we can encapsulate PPP sessions over Ethernet frame. Okay, great, but what is PPP? All right, so PPP stands for point-to-point -point protocol. It's, it is also a layer two protocol, which is mainly used to tunnel ISP packets to and from the modem and by doing, it, by doing so, enabling the internet connectivity. So PPP negotiation is where the client authenticate to the server and get its configuration parameters. And if all goes smoothly, a PPP tunneling interface is created on the client side. 
at this point, the client receives DNS configuration and usually an internet facing IP address. So at the, the end of negotiation, our router or machine should end up with an interface similar to this one. All right. Um, also, at any time, both the client or the server can terminate the session. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Now that we understand the general uh, flow uh, of the protocol, I'd like to focus on PPP and especially on the session negotiation part of PPP. So PPP is a layered protocol that has three components. First, there's an encapsulation component that uh, is used to transmit datagrams over a specific uh, physical layer. I'll soon go over on the specific uh, format and how it looks like. The encapsulation is used to transmit uh, something called link control protocol, LCP. This protocol establish, configure, and test uh, link as well as negotiate settings, options, and use of features. And lastly, after the connection is established, different protocol can be used to negotiate and facilitate a layer three network layer. In our case, uh, to tunnel IPv4, uh, and we use for that the IP control protocol or IPCP. Since PPP is a relatively big and have many protocol layers, I decided to focus on LCP, and uh, this is why I did that. Well, um, this is the first protocol used in PPP. It's used to set and receive different uh, configurations, and no authentication is needed. Okay. So to really understand PPP, let's understand the encapsulation format. So first we got an Ethernet frame with a PPPoE payload. The PPP encapsulate a PPP payload. And in this example, the encapsulated PPP packet is LCP type of packet. Now let's understand how LCP packet looks like. LCP packet contains an option payload to pass different parameters, for example, authentication protocol, magic number, maximum receive units, etc. And each option has a code number, length, and data. For example, here we see that uh, LCP packet that contains parameter for maximum receive units, authentication protocol, and a magic number. And uh, yeah, this is a different uh, option values for all these fields. All right, and there are all sorts of other parameters defined in the protocol, but the one I found most interesting was actually the last one, code number 19, endpoint discrimination uh, option. I don't have enough time to get in what this option does, and actually soon you'll see it doesn't really matter, uh, but yeah. Uh, but I discovered that although the RFC defines that the parameter length should not exceed 20, in the smart edge devices, it actually handles packet with bigger length. And it also has no validation on the data field. Also, I noticed that when uh, the PPP log is enabled in the Smart Edge device, I get long entries similar to this. Here we see uh, the, the different LCP parameters written to the log. For example, this is the authentication protocol used, and this is the magic number, and uh, this is the AA uh, as part of the endpoint discrimination field. So I'm writing a log entry with any data I wish and with a bigger length than accepted. Yeah, I think you all know what's coming next. Yeah, vanilla stack overflow in the smart edge log entry. And this is a great time for a demo time. Okay, so for this demo, I will be using four terminals. The bottom blue terminal is only a monitor terminal connected to the smart edge uh, device. 
yeah, this is the monitor, and the red and the green terminals uh, on the left will act as the STD in and STD out listeners for the reverse shell. And on the black terminal, I will execute my attack connected as a DSL subscriber. Okay, so now I'm running Netcat uh, to listen to STD in and STD out on two ports. Yeah, here I'm using uh, the first one and the second. All right, and now I will execute my attack by piping uh, being a sage to two telnet clients. So here I'm, tell, I'm piping the STD in to port 1337 and then pipe being a sage and STD out to the other port. Okay. Fire away. So now I'm sending the first two PPPoE session. Uh, creating a PPPA session by sending two packets, and this is the uh, LCP payload, malicious payload. And you can see on the monitor screen that I got a core dump, meaning that I managed to smash the stack. And now uh, I'm using my STD in Netcat to send commands. Here I'm using LS, and of course I'm going to echo my user and see that I am root. And uh, yeah, let's do it again. Just to thank you. Thank you. I can also grab some con other configuration like the DNS and I can write and read the DNS configuration and the admin for the device itself. But yeah, once, once I got root, I pretty much, uh, it pretty much ends. Okay, so not, now that we've seen a full working RCE, let's talk about uh, how to research this kind of equipment. So the most interesting conclusion I got from this research is that ISP network equipment is not that different from home routers when it comes to vulnerability research. Let's talk about the differences. So home routers are, uh, of course, cheaper, usually around 300 bucks, while brass entry level is a bit higher. Both of them uh, usually never get updates from the ISP which is great for hackers, but really bad for everybody else. And as you already heard, brass are way noisier, so if you plan to store them at, uh, on your kitchen table, you should expect to annoy people around you. And probably the hardest part is that setup and configuration part, since ISP equipment usually takes a specific expertise to install. So if you got enough, uh, so if you got some extra dollars and you're stumbled enough, you could also pawn an ISP network equipment. So based on my experience with this research, I'm thrilled to present my seven easy steps to research and pawn ISP equipment. First, firmware emulation. Then setting up debug and development environment. Jailbreak if needed get or buy an actual device, search and hopefully find vulnerabilities, write an exploit, and finally celebrate with your favorite beverage. Okay, so first step for every embedded device research is usually getting the firmware. I was lucky enough to find one online, and after a quick bin walk, I realized Smart Edge uses a NetBSD OS, and a PowerPC architecture. Luckily, up until 2006, Apple were using PowerPC processes with their BSD-based kernel. And this nice fella called Kernai posted a wonderful Reddit blog on how to emulate a very similar system to the one Smart Edge are using. And that way, I was able to emulate the user space of the Smart Edge firmware. Right, now for debug and development. I realized that cross-compilation to a different OS and a different architecture is pretty much a nightmare. So I decided to use my QMU machine to just uh, compile statically tools. 
I also use this SSH uh, TCP dump trick to sniff packets from my emulated device into my Wireshark host. Uh, well, that was super useful uh, to understand the different protocols I'm presenting. But I also had an issue with debugging. My GDB multi-arch on uh, my Ubuntu machine refuses to connect to a PowerPC NetBSD uh, system. So instead of spending time solving this issue, I just decided to run the GDB client from my emulated environment. And uh, yeah, this, this is actually was very useful later on when I remotely debug an actual device. So it just saved me some time. Okay, so next step was to understand if a jailbreak is needed uh, for debugging an actual device. So as you can expect, Smart Edge are using uh, this exec underscore CLI binary to handle all console commands. So logging from Telnet, SSH, serial ports, they all end up uh, with this jail terminal. But exec CLI must run some code of uh, some kind of, of other binaries. For example, when uh, you use the, com the telnet command in that shell, it executes this se underscore telnet binary. By the way, this is the same telnet client I was using for my exploitation earlier at the POC. Luckily, I found that this telnet client has an internal telnet command for just popping up a jail-free subshell. So yeah, so uh, another thing that, uh, please note that this is a telnet client. So to run the telnet internal uh, command to pop the, the jail-free uh, shell, I use this trick where I do telnet to my local host. And here you can see uh, the invoke subshell command. So all I have to do is just uh, use the exclamation point command and pop myself a jail-free CLI. <laughs> uh, now that I know that if I'll get my hands on an actual device, I can execute any code I desire. Uh, for example, this GDB server that Redback was kind enough to leave in their firmware. Right, so um, next I decided to buy an actual device. Theoretically, I could continue my research on emulated device and maybe even find vulnerabilities but I was missing the actual device configuration. I also had to do some serious LD preload uh, voodoo magic to get the emulation working, uh, which made it uh, limited to specific binaries, and it was pretty unstable in general. And also, if I have an actual device, I could develop a full working exploit like the one I demonstrated. Right, so I went to eBay and bought the cheapest device I could find, which is the Smart Edge 100. It cost around two grand. And uh, Aleph Research was kind enough to fund this purchase. By the way, at that point, I left Aleph Research and moved to CyberArk Labs. Yeah, all right. Uh, so I finally got an actual device. But I soon realized that I got little knowledge in setting up ISP equipment. Uh, and I had to acquire some kind of uh, ISP technician skills. So I started by reading this 100 page of basic hardware guide to understand how to physically connect stuff. I then had to read this 360 page of basic configuration to understand what configuration I need to do in order to create an ISP-alike setup. And lastly, to work with the CLI, I had to use this 900-page manual. And this is how I pretty much felt from all this useless information that I'm going to use only once. Yeah. OK, so to apply all this, all this information, uh, let's first go over uh, the device Sashi. Most of the ports on the device are either Ethernet or optical ports, 
to these ports, the ISP connect other network equipment, such as switches, routers, and DSLAM. And most importantly, the subscribers are connected through these ports. So my attack should be executed from one of these ports. The other ports are used for managing the device. So we got two Ethernet uh, management ports and a single uh, serial port. So there's two ways to configure and manage the device. The most convenient is, of course, the Ethernet port by using Telnet or SSH. Uh, but these ports can also be used for other uh, monitoring, such as log monitoring, packet monitoring, and even remote debugging with GDB. But the serial port is still very useful since it's foolproof. Meaning that even if I completely messed up the device configuration, I could always reverse it with the serial port. And believe me, I have messed the device configuration like a million times. All right, so finally I was able to configure the device with around 200 configuration commands. And I was ready for a full ISP-like installation. My setup included uh, an Ubuntu machine, three network cards, and a single port, uh, a single serial port. So I started by connecting a serial port to the foolproof console. I then used one network device to connect to the management device port, and then connect another network interface to simulate an actual subscriber connected to the bus. This is where I execute my, my vulnerability through this port. And lastly, I installed the device in our server room and connected my Ubuntu machine to the internet so I won't have to work from my kitchen table no more. Okay, so now that I own a smart edge device and I understand how to configure it and I got myself a server rack, I finally became the proud owner of Evil Communication LTD. So you guys are more than welcome to become my victims and to become my clients, of course, free of charge. <laughs> All right, but beside becoming uh, an ISP, I finally reached the research phase. So now I had three useful tools to help me with uh, the research. The Smart Edge Log, a GDB server, and a Wireshark monitoring. And now let's talk about the daemon itself that handles PPPD. Smart Edge is running a daemon called PPPD that handles PPP sessions. With some reversing, I realized that uh, incoming PPP packets are being handled by a function called packet receive. Packet receive calls some, a function called demux input packet for every packet uh, it receives. And this function is a log stream multiplexer for input function. Basically, it means it uses function pointers uh, for different log, uh, depends on what sub PPP protocol is being used. Here we see three logs protocol functions. Uh, for example, the LCP, the IPCP, and the NLCP. And as you guys already know, um, I was interested in the LCP log. And this is where I discovered that the endpoint discriminator log uses this unsafe mem copy to the stack. So if we go back to the LCP options uh, payload example, this is where my mem copy copies the data I control with invalid length to 35 bytes uh, of stack array. All right, and finally, it's uh, exploit time. So exploit development was very straightforward. There were zero stack mitigation, and I chose to use a single ROP gadget to exec VE. But when I was using the reverse IP shell in my demo, I was making a naive assumption. 
in the demo, I assumed that the brass has some kind of IP connectivity and was able to create a reverse shell to the remote server. When the attacker can control the brass by, and then the attacker can control the brass by connecting to that remote server. But what if the brass has no IP connectivity or it blocks by a firewall? How can I get a shell on the device using only layer two? So I decided to try and develop a layer two only shell meaning the entire shell will be executed over ethernet frame without the need for IP protocol, meaning the subscriber can control the device directly. So the first problem was that my exploit was limited to command shells only, like we saw on the POC. So first I had to execute my uh, exploit to deploy a bridgehead Bridgehead is a term for running a small exploit to update a bigger exploit. So if I was looking um, for a way, uh, sorry, I was looking for a way to execute a shellcode that will allow me to upload files using only layer two communication. Luckily, I had TCP dump installed on the device and I found this very cool trick to upload a file from a specific MAC address. Here we see that the TCP writes the content of 106 frames to a file called L2 shell. And I also used a filter to only pick up frames with a specific magic Mac uh, source address. So now I am no longer limited to a shell command. I can upload any binary I want and execute it by running my exploit again. But since I'm dealing with layer two connection, I needed some sort of raw socket functionality. Unfortunately, Smart Edge implemented their own undocumented raw socket, so I couldn't just use it easily. But fortunately, slash dev slash BPF was installed. And ironically, the only binary using slash dev slash BPF was the TCP dump I just abused. So I had to uh, configure BBF with these two flags. The first is telling BPF which interface to listen and the other flag is just receive the packets immediately. And now BPF listened to alert to traffic and if it detects a frame with a specific magic, uh, it extracts and run uh, its codes, uh, the, the specific commands. And now I truly done with exploiting the device. But wait, there's more. I would like to share another interesting vulnerability discovered by Omer Tsarfati, one of our researchers at CyberArk Labs. Uh, for this, let me explain how PPPoE session works. So every PPPoE packet has a code field. This field sets um, what type of message is being used in the PPPoE negotiation part. So the first phrase uh, is not mandatory and it's uh, mainly needed for the client to discover the PPPoE server MAC address. Uh, it does that by sending uh, an um, initiation packet and receive an offer from the server. And the next step is mandatory and in this phase the client requests the session number to start a session. So the client sends padar, aka request, and receive padas, aka session from the server. Also, it's very important to notice that both sides can terminate the session at any time by using pati, aka termination. So Omer discovered that when the client sends padar request with a broadcast as a source address, the Smart Edge PPPoE server sends a session packet with a broadcast as destination server, uh, destination address. Since no client expects an FFFFF as a destination address, it sends it again and again 
And if the server is configured with session timeout, it sends a termination packet. But this termination packet has a broadcast as destination MAC address. Meaning the server asks all the clients to terminate their session. Thank you. There is a bot here. There is a, there is a bot here. That this attack, it, it's, it still depends on the switch policy and uh, whether the DSL endpoints determine, uh, if the ADSL endpoints terminate uh, the session if, if they receive such kind of a request. I mean, a broadcast termination with no session number. Uh, but yeah, but anyway, it's a, it's a bug for sure and a really cool idea for an attack. Yeah, and now that we managed to pwn our smart edge devices, all it left is to drink rum with the fellas here at DEF CON. By the way, this is my noob shot from 2020. All right, and um, as for fingerprinting, so I managed to detect around 500 devices in 55 different organizations from 20 different countries using, uh, that were using the smart edge devices. Uh, but remember folks, these devices are not publicly, they're not supposed to be publicly facing. So I'm sure there are many more out there. And uh, I reached out to Ericsson with my finding and we worked together to reproduce and understand the issues and their severity. Ericsson suggested uh, to handle the CV assignment and they provided a CV number for the stack overflow uh, with a critical CVSS score and another CV for the uh, denial of service bug, but I haven't updated the slides yet, uh, with a medium uh, CVSS score. Ericsson also announced uh, that smart edge devices has reached uh, end of life, meaning these vulnerabilities are uh, infinity day. And uh, we also brainstormed together on possible mitigation and they communicated the issues to their customers. And as for mitigations, well, I strongly recommend to disable PPP logs on the smart edge devices. As for Omer uh, denial of service attack, I believe it can be blocked with switch configuration to block this kind of messages. And uh, also smart edge, well, they are really old devices. They are from the, the back 2000s. And it's highly recommend just get rid of them and replace them. All right, so to conclude, I hope I convince you that ISP network devices are not that different from home uh, routers when it comes to vulnerability research. That old school is still cool and a 50 years old network device can still cause a big ruckus. And as always, ISP usually don't pay attention to updates when it comes to both their endpoint and their backend equipment. Right, uh, looking forward, uh, a blog post will be published soon. And I might also look into other attack surfaces I discovered while uh, researching the smart edge devices. And lastly, I might have a look at other vendors and see if some of those uh, technique works. I mean, the denial of service works. All right, uh, thank you for your time. Feel free to reach out. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and uh, go see the latest season of Solar Opposites. It's awesome. And uh, if you got any question, uh, feel free to ask.